starters in those days and mail over to Pomona and that stuff, everybody, no matter what they tell you, they always move something. Danny uh, at Lions Drag Ship used to twitch his shoulder just before he pulled the flag up. You know, Mel, Mel would kind of like nod his head. I've got a picture of, at, at Pomona where Mel's got his flag barely off the ground looking at me going by him. You know, <laughs> move. Every starter, and that's why I spent a lot of time on the starting line looking at the, the idiosyncrasies of starters. They also, another thing about the flag starter, before they come to the lights, the Christmas tree lights, they used to put a button down there where the flag starter would put the flag on tip on a button. And if you move before the flag came off the button, you red lit. That's your know, first kind of deal where you start using a red light instead of the guy calling you out. You know, all those things that the guys today miss that was so much more entailed type of thing, you know. And, and I think a lot of the early fans would have missed today where you start on the starting line. The burnouts help a little bit, but pushing the push starts down and coming around to the starting line. There ain't really nothing like that at all. You know, in fact, one of my crew members for the Western Hoist Card when we went to the Good Guy shows in Vegas, and I, the assassin, there was another car I drove, the camera car from Jim Crook, an, an Ed Pink car, a Don Long car with a foot brake in it, and along with a handbrake. The camera Ford was restored, and uh, when we were running the Western Hoist Card, one of the Good Guy shows, basically, I was in that car, push started, and my crew guy, uh, Chris Nance, was in the back seat. And he had never never been around drag racing where you push started a top fuel car. And he told me later, he said, you push down, and I kind of bleed the car a little bit off and then hit the switch, and she just kind of bumped it up the way from the push car. The crew inside the push car gets this nitromethane kind of rolls in there. And Chris Nance, who knew more about nitromethane than the average person. He come back to me, pitch, he said, oh my God, I missed it. I should have been born earlier. That was, I, he, he, he said that he almost did something in the car, you know, <laughs> because he had never experienced that whole thing. You know what I mean? That whole, the whole part of the show that he's well, kind of missing today, except for the burn. I, I had the, I had the experience, you know, we, you and I were, spent a few moments together yep. out at the nitro revival. So the, the only experience I've ever had of a push start was when, uh, uh, the Ivo car and, uh, the Chisler, you know, Beckman was in the Chisler and, uh, who was in yep. the, was it, uh, Johnson? The, uh, no, yeah. Yeah. Right. So right, it was the guy. Yeah. Son of. Yep. So they, the, that was the and, only pu and, push start I've ever seen. And that was, uh, you know, for me, that was, a moment of nostalgia that I never, I, I never got to see, but how cool is that watching that happen? Well, the next time you have an opportunity to get in the push car, be in the push car when they push start. That's the part you want to be at. Cause that's where you feel the car punch, you feel the guy letting the brake out, letting the clutch out. You know, you see the little bit of a mist come out where they bleed the system and then the thing hits the bag switch and, the, and it pulls away and you get enveloped in the nitro into your car. That's the whole thing. Well, I'm going to have to see the next uh, next nitro revival if I can arrange to get in one of them push trucks with my camera and film the whole thing. <laughs> I'll, I'll make it happen for you. That'd Seriously. Be I That'd be awesome. So, okay, we 110 top fuel cars. You come out on top of that, which to me is just absolutely incredible. We're getting, we're getting close to 1971 here. That happened in what, uh, 67, 66? 66, because in 67, uh, basically I got, I got out of the car of Johnson's car and got back in the train. And that happened because of uh, John, John and Goob had a party in other ways. And, and basically, uh, McEwen, we had set a national speed record at, at, at uh, where was it, Carlsbad with Johnson's car. Uh, and, and McEwen wanted to ride. So he offered Don uh, to drive the car for free and tires because he was hooked up with Marvin Rifchin with the tires thing. So he got the ride out from underneath me. 
which is okay. I mean, we were all, we're all pals and that stuff. But then John, back in the train. So we go to Bristol. And in Bristol, so I'm driving a car made for Group Tuller. I get back in the train, we're running the train and that stuff. So I go back for the Spring Nationals in Bristol, which is May of 67. And uh, good your sponsorship. And I win the event. You know, and, uh, and that was a car hard for me, to, not hard for me to drive, but I had to hunker down because my head stuck up over the roll bar because the car was made for a guy a foot shorter than me. And uh, we, we got lucky and I was on my game and John was on his game and Bristol, Tennessee was a huge, huge mecca of people loving the freight train from the Ozark and that whole area, that place type of thing. And we pushed back down in Perdon one top fuel in the Bainey car. And we pushed down the drag ship to be interviewed with Keith Jackson. And about 25,000 people still in the stands, all rooting for the train, going, whoop, 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 you know, type of thing. In fact, Keith Jackson said, you're very popular down here. He said, yeah, the train has an awful lot of fans. You know, and that was the very first race that I was interviewed and it was Wide World of Sports. And so basically, I'm thinking later on, as you're driving home, I, I, I literally drove home and that stuff. I had to figure out what I was going to do because I was watching, working at the shop and the whole deal. And my dad was going out fishing every weekend because he, uh, he basically liked to fish and had a fishing boat. And we had prop the family had property in Catalina, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, so I told him that my TV had broke. And can I borrow the TV off of his boat? And literally, uh, he, uh, he, uh, he, he loaned me his TV. And that, I, that was when Wide World Sports was done later on. It was kind of two weeks, three weeks later. So I knew that he couldn't watch the race. And that's how I got away with that one. You know, so, and the car was, you know, we won a lot of races with that car, also with John and the cow catcher and the train. And was it still was it still fantastic configured? Ride. Getting, was it still configured at that point, Bob, with the with the two uh, Chevys in it? Oh yes, of course. The Chrysler didn't come around until later, okay. a couple of years later, just before Top Gas, because it's turned out that when we came back from Bristol, Tennessee, there was a UDRA meet. That was, I think, two or three weeks after Bristol at Lions Drag Strip. And remember, the tire situation hadn't evolved yet. The slippy, slippy clutch thing had not evolved yet in, the, in drag racing. It was sort of getting there, but it was very slow. And so, uh, and also when I came over to drive the, the car back in, with Quincy and that stuff, when it was a Quincy car, I've digressed back a number of years. Paul Schieffer sponsored me with my double B gas car. So he liked coming along with a Quincy car because we could do a lot of runs treating his clutches like a top fuel car because of our weight and our horsepower. So that became a very good partnership and that was a clutch situation. But at the U, now fast forward again to UDR, I mean, McEwen comes up to us and he and Marvin are in the tire business now. Marvin and that, and McEwen is his spokesman. Said, we'd like to put some in his tires in that. So that event race, we qualified, we put us in m hs on the car before racing. And the car come out, smoked the tires because we had 10 pounds air pressure in it, backed out of it, squeezed it, and the car went over 200 miles an hour, 200.44 miles an hour to be exact. And nobody, we had had the record about 190, 191 in, in, uh, in uh, Doris Herbert's records and that stuff. So McEwen and Ro Marvin come over to the car in the pits and McEwen says, how much air pressure you got in the car? Tired. I said, well, 10 pounds. And no, 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 no. He said, you got to let it down. So we let it down to six pounds air pressure. And first round of elimination, uh, the car runs, I mean, we're running 770s, 780s, like everybody else. And basically, the car ran 735, 201 miles an hour, <laughs> first round. 
Now, I've always paid really close attention to acceleration off the starting line. And that first 200 feet of that particular round of my life, I don't have any memory of. The car moves so hard. I mean, I let the clutch out, I'm gone. And the car, you know, all of a sudden I'm at 200 feet out and through the lights and that type of deal. And even when John picked me up, he asked me, he said, what do you think? I said, why? I said, it was really out the starting line. I don't have any memory of it. And he said, would you believe a 735? And I go, wow, really? 200 miles an hour, right? So now we're half of, about a half a second ahead of everybody else in top gas. And that car is constantly running at it. We ran two, 22 rounds of elimination without getting beat until I made a couple of mistakes type of deal. But that car kept running. In fact, later on that year, we went to Indy and so many people heard about us going so fast and quick that I'm coming to the starting for our first round of qualifying. And I'm running up against a top fuel car by the name of uh, the Fighting Irish was uh, Jerry Mulligan. Uh-huh. And, and I think who was the owner of the car, BB and Mulligan yeah. car. Very, very strange to have a top fuel car and a top gas car side by side. And I'm pulling up to the starting line. I'm looking over at the fence and the announcer must be saying something because the whole fence and crowd and wave of people are coming over to the starting line, to the, the fence on the side and that stuff. When we were qualified 734, 204 miles an hour, and I beat Mulligan. I qualified third for top fuel with a gas car. Wow. Unheard of type of thing. And we're going, wow, this is really something. The car is really moving. I'm on my game, the whole deal, right? And lo and behold, a drag racing guy jumps up and we've been a bunch of push rods, semi-final round. And um, pushing Kane beat us and went on to win the race type of thing. But that's drag racing type of thing. But I'll never forget that qualifying. Later on, that all changed because more cars come up and qualified and that type of deal. But as far as top gas is concerned, we had three tenths, three and a half tenths on the field. That, and coming that, back, that's, a, that's a huge advantage, too. That's not just a small advantage. It sounds small, no, but it's a huge advantage. Yeah, huge advantage. They talk about whole shots of tenths, hundreds of seconds yeah. back in a type of In fact, a lot of my top gas buddies and that's up to this day say they never signed it. But there was a time where they wanted to ban the train. Because, <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, but then again, too. But you look at history. What that what that happened was a big change. So now all of a sudden, we got a tire, we got a clutch, we got horsepower, and so everybody's realizing maybe we ought to do the same thing. So you had guys in the Midwest pushing Kane, not pushing Kane, but uh, who was the two guys? Uh, we run out, we come two guys from Kentucky. They kind of joined up and put two gas Chryslers in the car. And then Moats, Ray Moats, put two gas Chryslers in the car. Now all of a sudden we had 25, 30. Then you had the odd couple, you know, a Chrysler and a Chevrolet from out here with Walt Stevens driving the car, right? So all of a sudden you had all these twin engine cars, all the monsters of the midway, I called them, type of deal. And all the little one, the single engine cars, they got a good tire and that stuff. They had lightweight and they do their fair share, but you, Everybody had twin engine cars, and it was really, really uh, uh, incredible to view all that stuff as far as the spectators concerned. I'm serious. You know, and then IHRA quit top gas in 70, and NHRA let everybody know that 71 was the last year for NHRA because they had to be more professional because all other forms of racing, Formula One all the way down, Indy car, sprint car, had only one winner. So a lot of non-knowing drag race people, sports riders, and that said, well, well, who is the winner? Well, J stock, we have this guy. And B stock, we have that guy. And all the way up top fuel and top gas. So Wally, and I had a conversation with him because he lived in my neighborhood. We would see each other sometimes at dinner, some of the different restaurants. He basically said, we had to get professionals. So the top fuel, funny car, and pro stock was invented. Everything else was called sportsman. You know, and that put top gas in the sportsman in a handicap race. 
Yeah. John and I didn't like handicap. You know, we didn't like to have somebody else leave and then race after them. Yeah. I felt that personally was too dangerous. Although we did some match races. We did some match races with uh, Big John Masmanian with his Anglia. Yeah. You know, San Gabriel and that let him leave and me chase him and that. And when I, he would tell me afterwards, a driver would tell me afterwards that I roared by him in the light. I blew him off almost. <laughs> and then, so to me, we got the feeling that was dangerous. And why, why handicap? Because if I break out of my handicap, I'm a loser. Yeah. So we went ahead and me and John quit racing. Well, you know, and th this yeah. is, I, I, I've talked to several people about this and I think, it, I think I even talked to Steve Gibbs one at one point about the whole idea that top gas went away. And I, it's one of those classes that I, I keep hearing repeatedly from fans of that era that said, you know, that, that class should have never gone away. And I, I guess I can kind of understand what, what NHRA was trying to do. They were trying to make themselves more mainstream and whatever, but I, I don't I've never understood why top gas could not have continued as, as its own class, top fuel and top gas. I've never understood that. Well, Wally told me that basically you had the same kind of cars that um, top gas went not quite as fast, not quite as quick and not quite as noisy. Yeah. And they had to eliminate something because of the, the time refrains, everything, you know, and advertising also to remember that was just when big big corporations start to jump in on it. Yeah. You know, Mattel Toys was the first one with McEwen and, and Perdone. And so you start having non-automotive sponsorship coming in. And their number one question is, well, who's the winner? Yeah. The car that goes the fastest and the car that makes the most noise and has the biggest billboard. Like that's how come funny cars kind of almost put top fuel in the weeds. Yeah. Do you remember one time at Brist in Bowling in the Bristol, Tennessee, where they actually had an overall eliminator where they had a funny car and a top fuel racing for overall eliminator? Yeah, I've remember seen the that? pictures. Yeah, I've seen it. You know, where the funny car got a head start by a tenth? Yeah. They took an average of the ET difference and that gives the funny car. So there you talk about danger. Yeah. You know, when you have a top fuel car roaring up and you, you might lose control and sees the guy out there and trying to run him down, boy. Well, you know, I, you know Bob, I've uh, here. This is just an observation of mine by looking at all this history, and that's that the the last race at at Lions, December second, nineteen seventy two. It, in my yeah. opinion, it wasn't just the end of a single drag strip. It it sort of it sort of was the end of an era. Uh, oh, you're right. Absolutely. You know, and it was a, it, the era that ended was, I think, the era of blue collar racing. You know, a bunch of guys right. putting cars together and going out and racing. Right. You're absolutely right. You know, I've always felt, too, that there should be room for a senior tour. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be awesome. How cool would that be? Well, you know, you, nowadays it's it takes a lot of money to just put fuel in the tank, you know, type of thing. So, but the, it ain't like golf, you know, where the guy just drives himself there and you have a couple of golf clubs and some stuff like that. And you get spectators come in, get a lot of overhead with a race car. So golf. anyway, you, in 71 top gas comes to an end. You guys step away from it. Uh, uh, you come back to it in 93, but what happened in the meantime? You just went on to run your business and live life like everybody else, I assume? Yeah, um, we had a bad taste in our mouth. Um, I, uh, I basically stepped away. Um, I, had got, I got married in 74. I bought a, my second house. Um, and just, you know, I was a very lousy spectator. I couldn't go to the races that much because I'm a participant of life, not a spectator. I've always said to people. And so basically um, in 72, I bought the house I'm living in now, which actually next year will be my, well, actually this year, this is coming September, will be my 50th year in this house. Oh. Uh, I met my wife um, in, uh, my brother and I were still partners in the washing machine business. And 
I had a couple of nice cars and the whole deal. And so I met Sharon on a blind date, May 12th of 74. Uh, basically, uh, two or three months later, we got married and started that whole part chapter of my life. A great family, big Irish family, 55 first cousins. Her father was one of 10 children. Uh, very, very much of an entrepreneur kind of a guy. And I'm, you know, I'm madly in love with this redhead. And as time goes on, and my brother wants out of the business. So my put some things together and bought my brother out of the washing machine business in 75. He went on to become president and, and running of the Dressage Association of California. He was got into horses. Wow. Horses and that stuff, bought himself a ranch and started teaching after not even know how to do a horse, but ended up being a teacher of dressage. And my wife and I have two children. And uh, about 1984 or five, no, 83, 82, 83, I went to the Long Beach Grand Prix and I'm walking through the auditorium and I see this shifter cart business from England, zip carts from England, guys sell them in that. Turns out to be, looking at the address of the flyer he had, he's four blocks from where I live and just starting up. So I ended up renting the building to him and I buy my first zip cart, 125 cc. And we started racing at Willow Springs and Laguna Seca and Riverside. And now I'm in this little race car that looks like a miniature indie car with wings and stuff on them and a shifter motor, a Rotex motor, 50 horsepower, me and the whole car weigh less than 500 pounds and go road racing. And I'm telling you, I just got the need of speed backs in this thing with my leather suits on and that. And down the back straight of Riverside at 130, 140, 150 miles an hour into corners and really, really, really something you know, really fit my needs with speed type of thing and did that for quite a while, a couple of years. My kids loved it. My wife loved it and did a lot of traveling, especially Laguna Seca. And then that kind of went away and then uh, started going back to the drag races. Uh, Steve Gibbs and the museum started with the, the, uh, uh, the uh, NHRA um, thing in I think Wally Parks I think that the first race was in 92 the Hot Rod Reunion and that and John Peters was there in Beverly and we, we connected with all that roots and then John said uh, he was approached by putting the train back together got the bug because they never threw the frame away when they moved up north into Clear Lake the, the motors and the rear end and front end came off the car, but the frame and body went with them. In fact, one of the side panels was in Beverly's kitchen as the decor of her kitchen there. So John went home and put the car together with the help of his father, because 93 was our 30th anniversary of winning the Winter Nationals. And so um, I got, re you know, got, uh, went to Bill Simpson and he helped me out with a suit and a helmet again. We went to the test session at Bakersfield that they had at the time for the top fuel card before the Winter Nationals and got re-licensed. Uh, Ace McCulloch and Bernie, uh, uh, Kenny Bernstein signed my license off. In fact, he paid me a hell of a compliment when I went to the, his pits to get my card signed and that he said, Bob, he says, I closed my eyes and I used to watch you a lot in the car a long time ago when I was starting my career. And it was like deja vu. He said, you did exactly the same thing you did back then. Your, 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 your motivation, your, uh, your, what, you, what you go through preliminary wise, of what you do in the car, I'm, I'm very, very repetitious of all that. I get in the car at the same place. I get out of the car the same way. Maybe I'm superstitious, but that's just the way I am. You know, even today I put my right shoe on before I put my left shoe on, but that's just me. But so anyway, he, he paid me that comment and signed my license. And so we did that. We raced four different places. In Sacramento, we did the Winter Nationals. 
We did uh, uh, we did Sears Point, and we did Bakersfield. Again, you know the Hot Rod reunion the following year. That was that was a great deal. Fun fun stuff for my wife and everybody with the bib overalls. And then um, that kind of went away. John went back to doing his business and that stuff. The train was still there and would come out to cackle at a different place, but never ran the car, never ran the car again because NHRA didn't like that because of the old style roll bar insurance wise, it was probably a problem in that. The nostalgia top fuel didn't start up really until the mid nineties. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we finished out the end of the year. I'm going to races. I'm going to the hot rod reunion every year. My kids are getting older and getting out of the house. And I'm at the, the gathering of champions that NHRA started doing at the Winter Nationals and World Finals at the museum before the races on Friday night. And Pete Starrett approached me about if I wanted to drive a nostalgia top fuel car. And I said, yes. And so he introduced me to a guy named John Halstead, who owned a Western hoist car. And uh, we ended up running that car, got relicensed for that in 2000 at the Nitro, at the Hot Rod Reunion, and you started racing a good guy program in 2001. And we had, I think we went to five races that year, and I, I know seven races that year, including Indianapolis, and I won set five of them. Wow. <laughs> well, John didn't have a he was an old tuner guy, a Western horse had a, grew up in Hayward, California, and had early drivers back, you know, at top fuel back in that day, and Bill Dunlap drove for him back in that day. And he didn't have a crew. He moved down to National City to have a crew. So I put together a crew that had my safety involved first instead of the car going fast. And we literally um, had a tremendous amount of fun. We uh, didn't win a, a number. We had, had A fuel and B fuel, and we won three B fuels and two A fuel ones back in Indianapolis. But my wife and kids were there to go with us. And that was the biggest joy. I thank John and Jeannie Halstead for the rest of my life, period, for bringing me back to top fuel racing. Because I, I again got on my game. I got on my game. i tell you one was really great story about that. The kick-ass guy at that time was a guy named John Lichtenberg. John Lichtenberg drove a car called the Orange Crate yeah. out of the Midwest type of deal, or Illinois, whatever. And he, uh, we go into the final race, final round at Indy with the good guy short Indy. And we're running, we're running 620s, 610s, 130, 125, 130 miles an hour, because there's still issues with the car, trying to get it set up and tuning and, the canards were burnt brand new on the car and that stuff. And the car would go out about 400 feet and kind of settle. I used to call it a two-step mambo. She'd go out, settle nicely, and then go down the racetrack. So I get, my habit was always also was to go over to the guys I'm racing for my entire career and wish them good luck and be safe. Even back in the 50s when I was driving my first car. Let's have a good fun, good race time. So I go over to the crew and that, and he asked where John Lichtenberg was. And the crew chief said, well, he's busy right now. I said, well, I got to talk to him. He said, no, he didn't want to talk to you. I said, oh, okay. So I get back and I looked at Chris Nance, my tuner and all the guys there. And I said, the son of a whatever ain't going to talk to me. So I got pissed type of deal. Get to the starting line and I whole shattered him too open on the car so i'm going down the racetrack and two-step there stuff and right about a thousand feet i hear him coming you know saying, come on baby come on baby and then the number one cylinder on the left kind of goes dry wet so i'm losing now i'm on seven cylinders and just before the light my number four cylinder on the right hand side number eight it gets wet in that time and i still hear him coming at but i can see the finish line and right about 1,100, about 1,250 feet, I see the oil pressure go to zero. Oh. So I know I'm going, I ain't going to lift. You know what I mean? I'm not going to lift because the, the finish line is 50 feet away. 
you know. And so I beat him, and he rolls out the back door, you know. He's going 40 miles an hour faster than me, you know, because of my situation. And, and a lot of people ask me, well, how do you, how do you see all that? Well, good drivers see all that. If you got good reaction, you know what everything is doing. Well, you only did that in 6.10 seconds, I know. But for me, it's all in slow motion, every bit of it. And every good driver I've ever talked to, they have the same thing. They know every foot of that racetrack and what happens. Because we were the first computers. Remember, when I started driving, I told John, I told everybody, they asked, well, how was it? Well, this happened and this happened and this happened and check this and check that, you know, type of thing. Well, and I and asked we, I asked Joe Amato about that very question one time, and he gave yeah. the exact same answer you just gave. He, he said that, uh, uh, well, I asked him, I said, how you guys were running, you know, under five seconds. How, how could you tell what was going on? And he said, when you step in that car, as soon as you hit that pedal, everything slows down. Everything right. goes into slow motion for you, and you got you've got plenty of time to get everything done. That's right. You if you don't, you're you're behind the curve. You're not up to speed, and you shouldn't be there because yeah. you're going to get hurt. You know, it's like the first time I drove John Peters, I mean John Halstead's car, type of thing at Vegas. I explained to him at Vegas at the race. I told him what happened. I told him we lost four cylinders and had a flat tire. My first race, the first good guy race at Las Vegas type of thing. And I told him what happened point for point for point. And he said, how, how could you see all that, Bob? I said, look at John, this is easy. This is only eight cylinders. I'm used to driving 16 cylinders. <laughs> <laughs> well, so the orange crate, you end up beating them. Did he ever eventually talk to you or not? No, he never did. In fact, he, he didn't pull off in the same off ramp I did of turnout. He went farther down type of thing. And then later on, after all the accolades and the whole video and crowd and the whole picture taking and all that kind of stuff, which was surreal, the crew chief comes over to me and I've known him and I've saw him in other races since then. He said, Bobby said, I got to tell you a story. And I said, what's that? And he said, well, John, at the other end, John asked him, who was that guy that beat me? And John said, well, that's Bob Morales, Floyd Lippincott Jr. And he looked at and then I said, okay. And then his crew chief guy said, well, he asked me, he said, I thought that guy was dead. <laughs> and then, then I said, what'd you say to him? He said, uh, he said, yeah, dead like two open on the starting line. You know, <laughs> uh, uh, that's great. Part of the places and that stuff, but the man has never talked to me. You know, I've gone out of my way a couple other times to talk to him and he's never talked to me. But that's okay. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's really okay. You know what I mean? Because I had the I had the fun. And just to win that race with my wife and my kids there and my crew type of deal, you know, because some of those guys recruit on big car teams and that stuff, you know. Yeah. And like John and Jeannie said too, they did a lot of racing, that type of thing, and they played me a lot of compliments and that stuff, but it's it's all it's all about surrounding yourself with good intention people and being the best of it. No, you're not going to win everything, but you're going to have an awful lot of fun if you just immerse yourself into the situation, no matter what you do in life, you know, whatever so, you have. So your, your, your wife, she came into the scene after your drag, your first, let's call it your first drag racing career ended. So she was never part of all of that. So no, she, but she had no issues with you stepping back into a top fuel car. Huh? It all went great for as far as your wife was concerned. I promised her that she didn't know anything about my racing at all in the past. She's heard a lot about it, read a lot about it. A lot of people come up to her in the whole shot and that's all good, positive stuff. But I told her my habit is if something happens, I shut up no matter what the goal is. Yeah. You know what I mean? I've been through enough situations. I've not lost an awful lot of friends, personal friends that think that was their last rodeo and their last chance at the brass ring and end up hurting or killing themselves. And I vowed to myself, I'd never do that in my early career. And I told her the same thing. Trust me, this is the way it's going to go. And I, I surrounded myself with very competent people 
who had my safety involved. A lot of tuners out there think the driver is nothing but a nut to screw in and out of the seat. You know, so they don't really care. Well, if he does, that's okay. We'll just screw another one in. <laughs> so, I never drove for anybody like that. John Peters and I, Frank, were, you know, in fact, that's another story I didn't tell you about. When I started driving a Quincy car, I never raced in competition until they felt I was comfortable in the car. All right. And John Peters, remember, these two guys had already buried two of their high school buddies a guy named Leonard Harris and a guy named Mickey Brown. These were the two kick-ass guys and that stuff who did things that ended up and things breaking on the car that ended up killing them. And Peters told me right up front, if ever you don't shut off when you have a situation that we can see or whatever and start, just go away. We don't want to bury another driver and build another race car. So he put restraints because 22-year-old, 20-year-old drivers think they can conquer the world, me included. You know, uh, I can do that. I can, you know, I'm, I'm bigger, better than God, whatever your, whatever your mentality is type of thing. And so he, I got to rec- say that John and I, Frank, are the reason why I'm probably alive today because they put restraints on me. I wanted that ride. I knew that ride was the best car in drag racing at the time. And we all grew up together. Well, and that's part of that. What you just said, Bob, part of the, the fraternity, you know, being at the Nitro Revival uh, and seeing yeah. all of you guys interact, you guys all grew up together. And that's why the, it's such an amazing group of guys. Yeah. When you go to the Nitro Revival, it's like being around a giant family. It's just incredible. It truly is. And they're all in there. The engine builders, the chassis builders that are still alive today and all where they came from and all the things that made them what they are today. They were all participants of incredible lives, you know, and that's I say. The other thing I didn't tell you, but whenever I got in the race car and Sharon was always, I told you, I want you always in front of the car before we go to the starting, I start up and I would point in my suit, in my gear and that stuff. I point to my eye, to my heart, to her. I love you. And then I get on with business, you know, type of thing. It's truly really great, a great part. I mean, I'm, I'm the luckiest guy in the world, truly the luckiest guy in the world. All my, my, all my 15 minutes of whatever's the first parachute I ever, I was the first guy to put a parachute on a dragster. I, you know, and, and me and Jim Deese became really good friends and do a lot of stuff there. Safety wise, I'm always very serious about safety and race cars and that stuff. Uh, they're the balaclavas, the, the, the restraints on your helmets and that type of deal. A lot of the guys I was racing against in the nostalgia top fuel didn't re- wear any of that stuff. And I said, My God, he said, You're strap your body in, but you don't tie your helmet down. And that's the heaviest thing that controls the computer that makes all this machine work. Stupid not to especially when it all comes about because of people stretching their necks and being in comas and dying, you know, there's plenty of that. I mean, Earnhardt, yeah. one of the famous stock car drivers in the history of stock car racing, yeah. you know, he has a, you know, and it's so simple today for all those things. Thing, you know, it's really, sometimes you just gotta, uh, anyways, whatever. Well, I'm just lucky. And you know, it, you bring up, you bring up a, let's call it a sad point about the development of the sport of drag racing through the sixties was that, um, unfortunately, a lot of those safety technologies had to be developed at the expense of people losing their lives. And it's unfortunate it happened that way, but it's also what made this group of guys just barnstormers is what they were an unbelievable group of guys that would strap themselves in these cars. I, to this day, I'm still amazed that all of you, all the people that did walk away from it, walked away from it because it was so dangerous back in the early days. It was, yeah, but again, too, all that safety stuff developed by racers that who paid the open price makes all the cars, look at the cars we drive today, yeah. the disc brakes. I mean, even Formula One racing guys into the 60s didn't have a lap belt. What was the biggest problem with Formula One racing? was gasoline, not the technology, hoses hadn't come together. So the number one killer 
of Formula One races back in those days was burning. So what did they do? Fangio won so many races without a lap belt, without a shoulder harness, because if something happened, he wanted to get out of the car. You know, and it, I mean, drag racers had disc brakes long before Formula One. I mean, you have disc brakes, you have spot brakes yeah. long before Formula One. So I feel the drag racers puts more safety things in the mainstream people than any other automobile sport literally in the world. You know, our harnesses, our, our crossover straps that are in cars today, you know, fire extinguisher systems that were first in drag racing and went on to the rest of them. Look at, the, look at the, the sports car drivers of the 60s. They had a, a kind of a one-layer Nomex thing on it. looked really good as a kind of like a shop thing. <laughs> you know, bib overalls, they used to call them. We'd put a couple of patches on type of deal for the advertisers. But, you know, I mean, it's the same way as the fifth strap. I put the fifth. It's the only thing I did with the Quincy car. I put a fifth strap in it between my legs because... I went to El Mirage a long, long time ago, and a buddy of mine driving a belly tank lost control of the car and hit what they call a pucker bush and died in it because the belly tank had, he had no fifth strap in it. And he came out from underneath the harness because he was almost laying prone when he hit that pucker bush and he ended up killing himself. So, but a fifth strap would have made uncomfortable family situation, but <laughs> for the sake. Well, you know I, mean? um, I, I, I fully understand that. And, you know, it, I'm, I'm glad that, that, uh, all the safety stuff happened the way it did. And it's unfortunate that all the drivers were lost that, that paid the price for it. But I, I, I never fault any of those people because it, it, here's, this is kind of a philosophy that I have about our, our great country that we live in. We've lost the ability to do great things. It feels like we, we just don't do great things anymore because we're, we're so overly safety minded now that it seems like nothing gets accomplished anymore. And we need, maybe need to step back a little bit more to the way things used to be, I think, to get some great things done like the Apollo space program. That would have, that would have never happened today. That, that, no one would have ever dreamed of doing that today. No, it's all, it's all tending us up to computers put a computer up there and save a life, but computer can only be programmed so much. And if it has a, has a glitch in it, you know, I'll give you an example of computers. The washing machine business that I'm very much involved in, they have computer programs and computer boards in them now. They don't like water. They don't like moisture. But even the way that some of the ones that done in the early days, type of thing, I fixed a machine the other day that had broke because of a cobweb spider. A cobweb out on the motherboard and latest latest web because spiders of all them types not only catch flies, whatever they catch micro you know, stuff. Right. Well, in the back of this board, in this Maytag, when that's all I fix is Maytag, and it happened to be a spider gets in there and runs a web from one dial to another dial to set up its preliminary web in its home. Well, cobwebs have moisture in them. And low voltage, 12 volt DC current boards, which most of them are, it shorted out a diode and killed the washing machine oh. from a spider. And, and actually, not the web, but the moisture of the web. But it's cheaper to build that yeah. than to build something with points that go open and close with arcing. Yeah. <clears throat> I All go right. on and on about that stuff. Too. So I'm, I'm going to ask you about and i ask everybody about this who was there the southern california drag racing scene in particular lions drag strip you know all the mystique that's around that track and you know it closed so long ago that uh i've always wondered if the mystique holds if if the legendary status of that track is really true or if it's nostalgia but what what do you have to say about that is that track as special as it seems like it used to be well you got to consider the time and place of all this stuff Back then, you didn't have the volumes of weather controlling. I mean, every top fuel, every big team today, even the um, economy dragster guy, if he's worth his salt, he's a champion. He's got a weather station on board telling him basically the, the density, the parts of moisture and all that 
yeah. technical stuff, right? So it helps them get the maximum one horsepower, two horsepowers out of a, out of a motor that makes them different than the rest. Uh, a lot of people didn't understand the air density of Fontana, which was dry, and the air density of Lions. Lions had that, and it was close to the ocean. It always was more heavier air, more racing. Cars always ran better there. And also, look at the first guy that ran the place, Mickey Thompson, car club member, Bay Area, him and the people and that stuff, opened that racetrack up in, in 55. who they run? The car club that he was involved with, his Julian F. Sub, approached the nine Lions Clubs and said, okay, we want to do a fundraiser for your charity. And the Lions Club, they're blind. The, the Braillers for the Blind was their number one charity in that stuff. So they start off grassroots. I knew them personally. Uh, uh, they all kind of worked for paying the money. The money they got paid the, ba the baby sitters that took care of their babies at home while they did this passion they had. And it, it, without realizing it, it was a perfect place to run a race car because of its environmental impact that we know today. And then at nighttime, when they put the lights up and that in the nighttime and the food was always good. It was always good management running in a type of deal. <clears throat> I have um, videos of it when Stan Chambers did it with uh, with the Channel 11 with Mickey at night. So I had TV exposure with no other track ever had at that time. You know, and just time, place was magical. Really magical. Okay. The crowd was good. The food was good. The, the, the organization, Mickey and, and CJ Hart, who ran it later, type of thing. <clears throat> they all knew how to put on a show for the people. They understood it was about the people in the stands. You know, so always hurrying everybody up and filling the show in with stuff to, to keep the traffic happy and the, and the crowds happy. It's one of those tracks that I wish I would have had the ability to be at. I, you know, I was too young. My, I went to my first drag race when I was eight years old and, I never looked back after that. It was, uh, uh, for me, you know, my first drag race would have been in 1974 and it was, it, it was an old track and you know, the old lights and it got cool at nighttime and it was just the entire atmosphere to me, just mm -hmm. being at that first drag race in 1974 was just a magical thing for me. And I can kind of understand what you're talking about with lions, but it was just a, a feel that I never got past. I never stopped wanting to feel the way I felt that night at my first drag race. Yeah, there's enough. I think there's enough footage. Have you seen enough of the footage that they have at Lions? Oh, yeah. I've got the entire, I actually bought the entire DVD uh, documentary that was done on Lions. I've seen all of it. It's great stuff. Yeah. Yeah, it, um, it's something we would go out of our way to go to and that when we're lucky to have San Fernando or San Gabriel was a very big part of it all the old San Gabriel at night also, and then Fontana. We were very lucky out here that we had six big time drag races, drag strips within a 40 minute tow, 50 minute tow in traffic an hour to get there and back. And, you know, and a lot of people realized that the in and out when Steve Gibbs started managing uh, San Gabriel, which later became Irwindale, uh, the sponsor of that was in and out yeah. hamburgers their very first store in the Snyder family and that, you know, and the food was always good. But just, you know, I mean, kept the people off the street. Uh, the police were involved with helping them with that whole thing. Uh, Wally Parks. I mean, the whole complete building blocks of all that I was able to, because I consider myself an early second generation, but I knew all the first generation. I knew the, the yellow blocks. I knew, um, uh, <clears throat> Bill Simpson, Jim Deist, uh, my God, how far, far you know, um, Phil Wyan. I remember Phil Wyan introduced me as I'm picking up parts for my car to go to the Riverside. And he said, Bob, come on, I want to introduce you to somebody. And there's Gartlett's in the back behind him type of deal. 
with his carbureted Chrysler because he was out here to race Art Christman in the Hustler car at Riverside. And I'm fresh out of the Ivo school of putting motors together where you're meticulously clean like an operating room. <laughs> and he had just come in from an AHRA uh, winner uh, race at, uh, in Phoenix. And right where Phil's uh, um, shop was on San Fernando, was a whole bunch of junk shops. Junks, uh, car car places, junk shops, and he had blew up the motor, and I, so he went down and picked up an old Chrysler motor out of a hundred thousand mile mile car Chrysler, sat it in the frame rails, and then we could see the the grunge in the valley covers. He didn't care about that because he didn't have a supercharger on the car, and he take the heads out of the dirt and set them on the head. And crunch them down. You can hear the nuts and the rocks crushing as he's torquing it down and seeing his two daughters and his wife there. And I'm thinking to myself, oh my God, and he thinks he's going to beat our Christmas? Boy, where's he coming from, right? <laughs> sure, go to the races and he blows them off too straight. You know, lighter, quicker, the whole deal. And then there's a famous thing where they push him down through the, the stands that were in. The back straightaway where you push backwards up the drag, and he flips everybody off. You know, <laughs> just like that. All, all that, all this stuff. You know, I mean, all that kind of stuff is all just fills the whole void that you don't get to see today. Yeah. You know, today it's too clinical. Yeah. You know, and it's corporate. Yeah. And God forbid you if you if your corporate sponsor finds out that you that you gave. You're you're a, a Valvoline sponsor guy, and you give a part to keep a Pennzoil guy in business. That the races, you're losing. You're gonna lose your sponsorship. Yeah. You know what I mean? Where so many times we you say, well, yeah, sure, I got a spare supercharger. Oh yeah, I got some spark plug. You know that that family connection. It's there at the end, at the beginning, but not there at the races. Yeah.